evening and welcome to St. Jacob Lutheran Church. Good We're so glad that you are here to, this evening for our Holy Thursday service. Today, uh, this evening, it centers on uh, the Lord's Supper in which Jesus assures us of faith, gives us forgiveness, and uh, the certain hope of eternal life. Um, for the, uh, tonight, we are going to use the Christian Worship Supplement for our liturgy and also the first hymn. We'll sing the first four verses of the Lamb. Thank mm -hmm. you. Even when we were dead in our sins, 
Hear the word of Christ who is called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. And at this time, we'll sing the hymn um, 497, just the first two verses. Shall eat the meat that has been roasted over a fire, 
along with unleavened bread. They shall eat it with bitter herbs. Do not eat it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire, with its head, its legs, and its internal organs. You shall not leave any of it until the morning. Whatever remains until the morning you shall burn in the fire. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, ready for travel, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For on that night I will pass through the land of Egypt. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. Against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. There will be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike down the land of Egypt. This day shall be a memorial for you, and you are to celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you must celebrate it as a permanent regulation. This is the word of the Lord. We read responsibly Psalm 116 that's found there on page 3 in your worship form. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The Lord is gracious and righteous. When I was in great need, he saved me. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death. My eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. How can I repay the Lord? For all his goodness to me. I will lift up the cup of salvation. And call on the name of the Lord. The second lesson is recorded in 1 Corinthians 11. This is the account of the Lord's Supper given to Paul. And it, it contains also uh, elements at the end about who is to receive the Lord's Supper. And because of this command, we are to be properly prepared. That is, that we are repentant sorry for sins, and so we are to examine ourselves before we eat Christ's body and blood, uh, lest we do so to our heart. You read from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as oft, often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread, eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks, or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the Lord's body and blood. Instead, let a person examine himself, and after doing so, let him eat of the bread and drink from the cup. This is the epistle of our Lord. At this time, the choir will sing what wondrous love is this.
Please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel for this Holy Thursday is recorded in John 13, reading selected verses. Later in this chapter in 15, we have the answer for why we might call it, and why it was called for many years, Monday Thursday. In Latin, Mondus means command, and some have thought that this is because there was a new command. The two reasons for a new command, one was the New Testament, or new command of the Lord's Supper in which Jesus was giving. And the second was, in that verse it says, new command I give you, love one another. We read from John 13. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. By the time the supper took place, the devil had already put the idea into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He got up from the supper and laid aside his outer government. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, You do not understand what I am doing now, but later you will understand. Peter told him, You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord, not just my feet, Simon Peter replied, but also my hands and my head. Jesus told him, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, but his body is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Indeed, he knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, Not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he reclined at the table again. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because I am. Now if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example so that you would also do just as I have done for you. A new command I give you, love one another, just as I have loved you, so you also are to love one another. You may be seated. We sing the next hymn, 313, selected verses there, printed in uh, your worship folder on pages 4 and 5.
Lord Jesus Christ, who directed, directs us and his steps to the upper room. Our text is Mark 14, reading verses 12 through 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room up upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. Dear friends in Christ, it's called the Senecal, a word derived from a Latin word that means dining room. However, this particular dining room has been important to Christian pilgrims for 1,600 years. Why? The claim is made that this Senecal, located on what is called Mount Zion, a nickname for a portion of Jerusalem's western wall, is the same upper room that Jesus and his 12 disciples uh, gathered for and celebrated the Last Supper. What makes it even more impressive is that this Senecal, an upper room, is built over the location of King David's tomb. On the lower level, you will see Jews regularly gathering and praying in what has, in effect, become a Jewish synagogue. Yet the Senecal the pilgrims visit today can hardly be the same room where Jesus invited his apostles, take and eat, take and drink. Although the foundations of this building seem to go back to the third century, the Senecal you'd visit today, perhaps on a guided tour of the Holy Land, is a massive room that boasts soaring Gothic ribbed vaults. It's nothing like the architect of Jesus' day, and most archaeologists and historians agree that it was built by crusaders, perhaps sometime around 1200 AD. And yet, thousands upon thousands of religious pilgrims visit this synagogue each year. In, two, in May 2014, the, uh, that included Pope Francis, who kept a pilgrimage to the Holy Land by celebrating a Mass there. The Pope said, here the church was born and was born to go for, forth. Well, maybe. <laughs> the precise GPS coordinates of the upper room have been lost to the vaults of the past. But the pull of the upper room, especially for Christians who gather for worship on Holy Thursday, uh, remains as strong as ever. Tonight we go there again on a quiet pilgrimage of faith that is guided by God's Spirit speaking to us through the accounts of the Gospel writers, particular, uh, in particular Mark. Our Savior's inspired tour guides uh, are careful to show us how his final steps led to the upper room, a room where his disciples carefully prepared the Passover and a room where God's lamb carefully prepared to die. Before you and I step any, uh, 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 in, any further into God's inspired uh, uh, record, permit me to share you a disclaimer about the message uh, of the upper room. It'll feel different from most of our faith pilgrimages there. Uh, how, how so? Well, when you and I visit the quiet upper room, we usually go there fully expecting to hear about the Lord's Supper, to hear the Lamb of God's gracious command, take, eat, this is my body, take, drink, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is poured out for many. We travel to the upper room in spirit because we yearn to hear uh, how Jesus gave this visible gospel as a tangible proof uh, and a gift for believers, something we can see smell, taste, and touch. When we 
partake of uh, the Lord's and stand at the uh, communion rail and partake of the Lord's supper. A weight as heavy as uh, hell itself is lifted off our shoulders by our Savior's guarantee. A promise made by Christ's servant distributing the Lord's Supper. When that servant comes to us one by one, looks us directly into, the, into our eye, and speaks the guaranteed promise that is true because of the Lamb's poured, the blood poured out on the cross and says, for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Though the, this sermon will uh, focus more on the setting than the supper, the Lord's visible gospel is not being swept away in tonight's service. Our entire Holy Thursday service, its liturgy and its hymns, is centered on the supper, on preparing for it properly with our heartfelt confession of sins, in hearing Bible readings that teach about the supper, in receiving the Lord's Supper at the railing, and being uh, restored to live a new and holy life for the Lamb who gave His life for us all. Though Holy Thursday is all about the Lord's Supper, we all need to realize that the Supper did not just fall down from the skies through angelic caterers. The Supper was carefully and purposely rooted in the Old Testament celebration of the Passover. In the upper room, the disciples carefully prepared the Passover, and it took hours. Some of you know that in 2012, we offered a Seder meal here at St. Jacob. We used materials prepared by Dr. John Lorenz, who was a former president of Michigan Lutheran Seminary, uh, a Wells Preparatory School in Saginaw, who precisely details how to lead a Passover celebration. It carefully follows the ancient Jewish ritual, but it also adds dialogue that clearly points to Christ the Messiah. The meal itself lasts several hours because the Passover is elaborate and it's scripted. Passover is a millennial old ritual that consists of multiple carefully prepared dishes. It includes the carpus, which is an appetizer of parsley, onion, and boiled potato uh, in salt water. Matzah, which is unleavened bread made of nothing but flour and water. Uh, Karasov, uh, a paste-like sauce that's made of fruits, nuts, and wine. Maro, uh, bitter herbs, usually that's horseradish, but if you're, you can't handle that, then romaine lettuce will do. A roasted egg to signify the offering that is brought to the temple. Each course is it, eaten solemnly and slowly. Each course is accompanied by a script passed down through the generations, teaching how the Lord freed his people from bondage in Egypt. And don't forget the four cups of wine served at intervals during the meal. All of this done is done in an elegant setting, like a state dinner, with the finest dishes on the table and the finest accommodations in which to, uh, in which to host this formal affair. Much meticulous care went into preparing the setting we know as the upper room, a room that had been ceremonially slept, swept the day before to make sure that every last crumb of yeast was cleaned out of every nook and cranny of the home where the meal was to be taken place. When Jesus told, so when Jesus told two of his disciples to go into the city and to find an owner who would show them a large uh, upper room furnished and ready, the disciples must have been dancing the jig. Host, uh, hours of careful preparation had already been done. Was there any preparation left? Have we forgotten anything? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> the lamp. <laughs> the centerpiece of the Passover. That meant hours of more time-consuming preparation since Christ's disciples couldn't just walk to the nearest Jewish deli and pick out a pre-roasted lamp. The sacrificial lamb had to be purchased, perhaps at an inflated cost, for it had to pass the inspection of the temple priests. The lamb had to be slaughtered that Thursday afternoon at the temple, and then it was roasted carefully before the evening meal. Lots of work to be sure. So time consuming that it takes hours of preparation. But the most intimidating task that lay ahead is finding a quiet upper room. 
Joseph Josephus, the historian, tells us that Jerusalem's population soared to over 2 million people during Passover. Everybody was looking for a quiet upper room in the city. Since the Jewish uh, Mishnah, that is the commentary, forbade carrying a slaughtered lamb outside uh, in the temple, that was slaughtered in the temple outside the city walls. Large upper rooms, big enough to host Jesus and his apostles, or 13 people, were hard to find. A, a, a large, uh, they were a hot commodity, furnished and ready, yeah, good luck with that. That seemed impossible. But not for the Lamb who later reclined at the table with the twelve apostles. Not for the Lamb who said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Not for the Lamb who knew how vital the upper room was in God's plan to save you and me. So God's Lamb sent Peter and John into Jerusalem with directions that were fail-safe, even though they seem puzzling and vague to you and me. Go into the city, and there you will find a man carrying a jug of water, uh, and he will meet you. Follow him. That servant carrying water may as well have had on blaze orange hunting, uh, hunting jacket with targets painted on his front and his back. In that culture, men simply don't fetch water needed for drinking or for the elaborate Passover meal ritual washings. That was women's work. But Jesus could see this man out of the millions that were there and then tell his disciples, whenever, wherever he enters, tell the owner of that house, the teacher says, where is my guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. Was the owner of the home a devoted follower of Jesus? Well, it appears that way. Otherwise, the home, uh, why would the title, the teacher, be enough to secure the upper room? It was no accident that his final steps led to the upper room. Hours of careful preparation by the disciples were needed to carry out the evening celebration. Preparations that it would have failed if not for the Lamb's divine guidance. But failure wasn't uh, possible, since an eternity of careful planning by the Lord sent, uh, it went, in, went into securing that upper room. This was a room where God's Lamb carefully prepared to die. A death shroud nearly covered Jesus, who reclined at the table with his apostles in the upper room. The Savior regularly departed from this very old Passover script on Holy Thursday, sometimes in alarming ways, as when he uh, paused and warned, Amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. No less shocking were Jesus' references to his coming slaughter as the Lamb of God. In the supper itself, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is poured out for many. Amen, I tell you, I will certainly not drink it again until the fruit of the vine, uh, again of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. In his stern warning uh, with his disciples, this night you will all fall away and account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Add to this the anguish uh, warning directed at Peter. Amen, I tell you, today, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. On top of that, add all the Savior's words so carefully crafted, so graciously preserved for us in John's Gospel, the Lamb's legacy, the Lamb's last will and testament, life-changing words, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. Life-giving words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And life-saving words for times like now. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not let it be afraid. The Savior gave us all these words and so many more. 
all because his final steps led to an upper room. He knew he needed a secluded spot, a room where God's lamp carefully prepared to die, a safe place hidden away from his enemies and, un, uh, and where he could enjoy a few hours of fellowship with his disciples one last time before his death. He foresaw all this and he made it very clear in those instructions that he gave to his disciples, leading them to a man carrying water, who in turn would lead them to an owner who only needed to hear the words, the teacher uh, it says, where is my restroom where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And voila, an upper room, furnished and ready, fit for the king of kings, became the servant of all. Yet when we carefully piece together all the gospel accounts about the message that Jesus passed along for the owner of the upper room, we learn that there is a tad bit more uh, than what uh, Mark records, a bit of essential information that added urgency to the Lamb's request. Listen closely. My time is near. I will observe the Passover with my disciples at your house. My time is near. The chosen time is now, the appointed time, the time that the Lord had set from eternity itself was now at hand, the time set for all our Savior's final steps, to the upper room, to the garden, to the betrayer, to the trials, to the scourging, to the stone pavement and the trial before Pontius Pilate, to the Via Della Rosa, the road of sorrows, to the center cross on Golgotha where God's Lamb would forever finish the messy business of washing away the stench of humanity's sin, yours and mine included. But this is where the Holy Thursday message needs to get a little more personal. For you see, the same Savior who could peer into a city of two million people at Passover time and pick out a man that was carrying water, a water jug, and an owner who uh, would open his home after simply hearing the words, the teacher says, the time is near, is the same Savior who hung on the cross because he peered down the corridors of time to see me in the parsonage, hungered down and alone. My Savior could see that my life is not a, a string of endless refrains of hallelujah, praise the Lord, or God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Instead, it's moments of weeping, of worry, of fear, flickering moments of questioning my father's plans and even brief flashes of anger. Because you see, there's a trespasser staying in the parsonage and it won't do any good to call the sheriff, to throw him out, because it's my sinful nature. And all of you have one too. And this explains that sometimes, especially when life is hard, we get frustrated, we get testy, we get crabby, we get that we worry and we get more than a little fearful. But God's Lamb knew all about that, and He paid for all of that. Because nothing takes our Lord by surprise. Nothing, no one, not death, not even the, the gates of hell can undermine His plans. His final steps led to the upper room exactly as planned. Mark factually reports, his disciples left and went into the city and found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he arrived with the twelve. The next day, his final steps led to the place of the skull, as his father had planned. Amen. I may the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Please stand and we'll say the Apostles' Creed. That's found on page 32 and 33 in the worship summary. The Nicene Creed on page 32. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all.
all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in the unity of the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated in the room. Please rise for prayer. Our Savior Jesus Christ, God, provided us with the Passover lamb to save us from eternal death when he sent you into our world and sacrificed you on the cross for our sins. O oh, work true repentance on our hearts, causing us to make sincere confession of our sins and to believe with joyful trust that he has forgiven us for your sake. May your body and blood given and poured out for our sins and imparted to us here this evening in bread and wine, in that supper which commemorates your death, ever nourish our faith, cheer our hearts, and strengthen our will to live godly and upright lives. Gracious Lord, drive out all hypocrisy from our hearts, and grant to each one a heart truly set upon you, and lips that make bold and honest declaration of your name to others. Do not allow Satan to rob us of the treasures of heaven, by tempting us to love the treasures and pleasures of this world. As you went res resolutely forth to meet the enemy, intent on doing the Father's will, so may we be set to obey him in everything, so that what pleases him pleases us. By your Spirit, help us to watch and pray at all times, and to be fully aware of the weaknesses of our flesh. And if the time of victory over our sinful flesh and the wicked world <coughs> seems long in coming, and the evil on every hand oppresses us. Teach us to find joy and courage to believe in your promises of eternal salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will read responsibly the personal preparation for Holy Communion so that our hearts are ready to receive the sacrament. This is at the bottom of page 5. What does God tell us about ourselves in his holy word? He says that we are sinners and deserve only his punishment. What should we do if we are not aware of our sins or are not troubled by them? We should examine ourselves according to the Ten Commandments and ask how well we have carried out our responsibilities as a husband or wife or a single person, as a parent or child, an employer or employee, a teacher or a student, and we love God with all our hearts, gladly heard his word, and patiently endured affliction. Have we been dis 
disobedient, proud, or unforgiving. Have we been selfish, lazy, envious, or quarrelsome? Have we lied or deceived, taken something not ours, or given anyone a bad name? Have we abused our bodies or committed indecent thoughts to linger in our minds? Have we failed to do what is right and good? When we realize that we have sinned against God and deserve His punishment, what should we do? We will confess before God all our sins, those which we remember as well as those of which we are unaware. We will pray to God for His mercy and forgiveness. How do we receive His gracious forgiveness? His word assures us that Jesus led a pure and holy life for us and died on the cross for us to pay the full price for all our sins. Through faith in Jesus, we have been clothed in our Savior's perfect righteousness and holiness. What further assurance do we have that Jesus is ours and we are His? In holy communion, he gives us his body and blood together with the bread and wine as a truly life-giving food and drink to unite us with him and our fellow believers. By means of this sacrament, Jesus not only forgives our sins, but sweeps away all our doubts about his love for us. He gives us his own strength to live a God pleasing life and grants us a joyful foretaste of heaven. How can we be sure that we receive all of these blessings in the Lord's Supper? We have his own words spoken as his last will and testament on the night before he died. There he tells us, Take and eat, this is my body. Drink from it all of you. This is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. How will we respond to this priceless gift from Jesus? We will daily thank and praise him for his love. With his help, we will fight temptation. Do our best to correct whatever wrongs we have done and serve him and those around us with love and good works. Lord Jesus, with joy and gratitude, let us now come to your table to receive this precious food of your life-giving body and blood. May it strengthen us to remain in you as you remain in us, so that we bear much fruit in devoted service to you and in acts of kindness to others. Amen. If we now turn to page 34, there you'll find uh, the holy, holy, holy at the bottom of 34. Uh, listen as the music is played to the first verse, and then we'll sing uh, the words to the next uh, two uh, verses.
acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation he became one with us. By his perfect life he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in as often as you this do in remembrance of me. He took then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. Amen. May the receiving of Christ your body and his holy precious blood assure you how much Jesus loved you, that he suffered, that he went the way of the cross, that he died 
so that you might have faith, forgiveness, and eternal life. The peace of God be with you. At the appropriate time, we'll sing the communion hymn 135. We'll do that straight through.
So we will sing the song of Simeon to the tune of him uh, of Kurtan, that's the, the hymn 388 in the Red Hymn Book, but the words are on page 37, the song of Simeon there. So listen again to the first verse of the music and then we'll sing the next one.
welcome to each and every one of you for any guests. We ask you to sign the guest book and then our thanks and please come and worship with us again. Um, thank you to uh, Marlene, the organist. Uh, Usher is the choir for singing, and I forgot to thank for uh, helping us out this evening, uh, especially with the choir's music. Um, on the back, very back of the bulletin or worship folder, uh, services, take note that tomorrow night's uh, Good Friday to Drive service starts at 7.30, not 7. That's the only one that we do of the year. That's because it's not dark enough by the time uh, service would end at 8. So at 8.30 it is. Uh, that is a service of darkness, and so we're trying to um, reflect that in the service. So we invite you to that. And Easter Sunday, there's a breakfast from 8.30 to 9.30, and uh, then an activity for the children and it starts somewhere 9, 9.15, something like that, and then after uh, an Easter, you come as well. Um, I'm looking for a couple of volunteers to maybe spread some Easter eggs, just the eggs. We're going to put the candy, we can do that tonight too, in, into bakes as we've been doing some years, but uh, on Sunday morning just to uh, put some eggs out in the yard. And then the second is a volunteer to uh, uh, handle another test too, if you, if you could, it involves the water jugs um, with that. So anyway, if you I can help in either of those ways, uh, uh, talk to me after. Um, any other announcements? Will there be plastic gates into? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we found one when we were taking and planning when we found yeah, the, the, it was camouflage gates, though, so I can understand what <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anybody else? Um, I'll greet you on the way out and know that uh, uh, his steps led to an upper room where he could say, uh, uh, show you his love uh, in a visible way. <laughs>